Hi, in this video I would like to discuss about infected dentin and affected dentin. The reason why I chose this topic is because we tend to get several questions uh, during our postgraduate entrance examinations from this topic and also from the clinical point of view this topic is really very important because identification of infected dentin from affected dentin really plays a crucial role in deciding the prognosis of a restoration. So before going into the details of infected and affected dentin, first of all, a Fusiyama et al. have identified that a carious dentin has different zones and they named it as infected as well as affected dentin. So before going into details of the infected and affected dentin, first let's try to understand the difference between infected and affected dentin so that we'll have some clarity over what we are trying to understand today. First coming to infected dentin, so infected dentin is usually present on the outer side or outer surface whereas the affected dentin is present more towards the pulpal side or towards the inner surface. So infected dentin forms the outermost layer whereas infected dentin forms the innermost layer. And coming to the presence of bacteria, infected dentin has a numerous quantity of bacteria whereas affected dentin has no bacteria. So that's another difference. So coming to nature of collagen destruction, collagen is irreversibly denatured in case of infected dentin. Whereas collagen is reversibly denatured and the collagen has the potential to act as a meshwork so that remineralization can take place. So all these changes can be seen in affected dentin. And coming to the ability to mineralize the tissue, infected dentin cannot be mineralized whereas affected dentin can be mineralized and that's the reason why we try to preserve affected dentin while removing carious dentin, right. And coming to vitality, as infected dentin has numerous quantity of bacteria, it's basically a carious necrotic tissue, it is considered to be dead, whereas the affected dentin has tubules, orontoblastic process, etc. And there can be even response to stimuli. So it is considered to be vital. So you can see no response or sensitivity in case of infected dentin. And there can be response to various stimuli, osmotic stimuli, mechanical stimuli, or dermal stimuli in case of affected dentin. And coming to sustainability, if we use different kinds of caries detector dyes, Infected dentin takes up the stains or stain and affected dentin doesn't take up any stain. So apart from these changes, other noticeable changes which we can anticipate between affected and infected dentin is in case of affected dentin, there is mineral deposition within the tubules. And in case of infected dentin, there is nothing like mineral deposition, but the entire tissue becomes more granular, teeming with a lot many bacteria. So these are few differences between infected and affected dentin. So after having understood this, coming to the second aspect of our class today. So how do we or how relevant are these clinically? So why do we need to understand the differences? So coming to the clinical point of view, we usually identify the differences between infected and affected dentin based on two criteria, usually. One is discoloration and the second one is tactile sensation. So in clinical point of view, we use these two parameters in order to identify and differentiate infected dentin from affected dentin. So coming to discoloration, we all know that infected dentin is light colored compared to affected dentin. And also infected dentin is softer in consistency the moment we place a uh, sharp explorer compared to affected dentin. So we use these parameters in order to identify infected dentin from the affected dentin clinically. But the problem here is this is not standardized. The reason why I said it's not standardized is because 
Discoloration is only prominent in case of chronic caries but not in case of acute caries. So in acute caries there can be mild discoloration. So that's not a reliable parameter in order to, in order to differentiate infected from affected dentin. And the second parameter which we usually use clinically is tactile sensation. As you all know, tactile sensation is not a reliable guide because I might feel it to be softer. The other person or the other operator might feel it to be a bit harder. So the tactile sensation can be variable between different operators. So that's the reason why these two guides cannot be used or they cannot be relied upon in order to differentiate infected from the affected dentin. So what do we do? How do we identify clinically? That's the reason why we have caries detector dyes which really help us to detect the infected from the affected dentin. As I have mentioned previously, the infected dentin takes up the stain thereby helps us in identifying it from the affected dentin. So ultimately our goal is to remove infected dentin and preserve as much as affected dentin as possible because affected dentin has the potential to mineralize as the collagen is reversibly denatured it still acts as a meshwork or a lattice structure on which mineralization can happen. So after understanding the differences between the infected and affected dentin and their clinical relevance, it's even important to understand the pioneering work done by Fusiyama et al. Because based on that, we can come to certain conclusions which really help us do a clinical work in a much better way. So let me explain that now. Physioma et al, when they observed the histologic sections of a carious dentin, they have identified three fronts bacterial front, discoloration front and softening front BDS you can remember it as BDS and if you notice the bacterial front is more towards the external surface or towards the enamel whereas the softening front is more towards the pulpal side so as the name itself indicates bacterial front means there are plenty of bacteria in that zone Discoloration front indicates that there is discoloration and softening front indicates that the dentin present there is softer compared to that of normal dentin. And now if you observe these graphs, so these are the graphs comparing acute and chronic caries in regard to the distance between different fronts, in regard to the hardness and in regard to the depth of penetration if you observe a graph simply on the x-axis you have the depth of penetration of the bacteria here this is the DEJ and this is the pulpal chamber so as we proceed from left to right the depth increases from the DEJ towards the pulp and on the y-axis you have the hardness values ranging from 10 to 70 right so these graphs give us an idea regarding the distance between different fronts b d and s and also their level within the dentin and their hardness value so we get we tend to get three parameters from these graphs one is the proximity between b d and s and another one is the hardness of these zones or areas and also their depth relative depth the reason why we need to understand is because once we interpret these graphs, we tend to get a lot of information. So let's try to interpret them. If you observe this first graph, in case of acute caries, you have B here, D here and S here. As you can notice, so the distance between B and D is greater in acute caries compared to that of chronic caries here the distance is much lesser so that's one difference which we can notice and secondly as you can commonly observe in both the graphs the softening front is present in more deeper aspect compared to the discoloration front which is deeper compared to the bacterial front so that's what i've explained you previously the bacterial front is present more towards the enamel side whereas the softening front is present more towards the pulpal side so that's another interpretation which we can get from based on this graph and the third one is look at the hardness values the hardness value of softening front the moment we hear it as softening front we assume that the hardness of softening front is less 
It is less compared to that of normal dentin, but not lesser compared to discoloration front and bacterial front. You need to understand that. So this softening front hardness value is greater compared to discoloration front and the bacterial front. Right. The reason why we are calling it as softening front is because if you observe these dotted lines, this is nothing but the hardness value of a normal dentin. So the hardness value of the softening front is less compared to that of normal dentin. So that's the reason why we're calling it as softening front. And now if you observe the chronic carious lesion, as I have discussed previously, the distance between the bacterial front and the discoloration front is very less. And you can observe that the distance of these zones from DEJ towards pulp is as follows. So as discussed previously, the bacterial front is more superficial, followed by discoloration front, followed by softening front. And then if you observe the hardness values, it's almost the same. So with respect to the hardness values and the depth from the surface towards the pulp, both acute and chronic caries have more or less the same values. However, the difference between the acute and chronic carious lesions lies in the fact that the discoloration front is farther from the bacterial front in case of acute caries whereas in case of chronic caries distance between the discoloration front and the bacterial front is very minimal so how do we interpret this clinically so it's understood that based on these graphs given by physioma et al published in journal of dental research the moment we are trying to excavate caries or discolored dentin in the chronic carious lesion, it's always advisable to remove entire discolored front. Because the moment you remove the entire discolored front, then even the bacterial front gets eliminated because both are in close proximity. So in a chronic carious lesion, it's always advisable to remove all discolored dentin which is visible clinically. Whereas coming to acute carious lesion, as the distance between the bacterial front and discoloration front is farther, so it doesn't matter even though if you leave out some amount of discolored dentin. So that's in case of acute caries. So based on these graphs, we can understand a few vital information in regard to the depth of various fronts, in regard to their hardness values and most importantly the distance between different fronts and how we need to apply that clinically in order to preserve as much as affected dentin as possible. So this is in brief about the various differences between infected dentin and affected dentin, various clinical parameters which we commonly use clinically in order to differentiate infected from affected dentin, the role of caries detected dyes and the graphs given by Physioma et al based on bacterial discoloration and softening front and the interpretation of graphs and their application clinically. So understanding these basic concepts is really very much essential so that it's not just about answering multiple choice questions but once you understand the concept thoroughly you can apply it with greater confidence clinically. You will know when to remove a dentin and when to preserve dentin and if, if in case you come across some kind of discoloration related to caries you will clearly know whether you, are, you need to remove that discoloration or not based on the condition whether it's acute or chronic. So this is about infected and affected dentin. Thank you.